today our Bible reading, Matthew, chapter 13, verses 1 to 23. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people st stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Your farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on the rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because, because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they, were, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thrones, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil where it produced your crop. A hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have on abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have, will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parable. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed of sown along the path. The seed falling on the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thrones refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of his life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil refers to someone who, he who hears the word and understands it. This is, this is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or 30 times what was sown. Thanks to the Lord. Amen. How many languages do you speak? Tamil and English and Rain. That, that's three, is it? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I have trouble in my first language. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Before we think about that uh, together, we're going to sing the harvest song, We Plough the Fields and Scatter. We plough the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fair and watered by God's almighty hand. He sends the snow in winter, the water swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine, and soft refreshing rain. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. 
He only is the maker of all things near and far. He paints the wayside flower, He lights the evening star. The wind and waves obey Him, by Him the birds are fed. Much more to us, his children, he gives our daily bread. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. We thank you then, O oh Father, for all things bright and good. The seed time and the harvest, our life, our health, our food. Accept the gift we offer for all the loving parts, and that which you most welcome, our humble, thankful hearts. All good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, oh thank the Lord, for all his love. We thank the Lord. No overtime today. <coughs> Lord, help us to understand and take in what you say to us today. We'll be different for different ones of us. So we open our ears. In Jesus' name, amen. The idea of every plant is to produce seeds and then more plants. It's fairly obvious. The reproduction of plants. It wants to flower, make seeds. And these seeds make more plants, and they vary in size. Here's a few. This is one, delivered to my house yesterday by a squirrel, a walnut. Uh, I, one year I found 13 walnut plants, trees growing in my garden, the squirrels have planted. They're a real pest. Here's another big one, a conker. Here's a rose hip, which I just took off there. And if you did what I do, you would open it up and see the seeds. When I was a naughty boy, which I was, nearly always, you put those seeds down somebody's back and they don't half itch, it's great. <laughs> really annoys your brother, <clears throat> but if he's older than mine, he'll thump you, I'm older than me, he'll thump you like mine was. Everybody knows, if they grow things from seeds, that they've had some horror stories. Uh, here are some of my parsnips. These are a pair of trousers with only one leg. By this time, this should be three times this size. But I had to plant my parsnips four times this year. They didn't grow. Can you guess why? Too dry. And I didn't water them. So, you know, that's pathetic, but it's tasty. I also grew some, that was conditions, that's the conditions. I also grew some lobelia. It's, came in a packet said trailing lobelia, so it would grow like this and trail gracefully down. But it was the wrong seed. So it went up and didn't trail at all, and it smothered the other plants in the pot that Elizabeth had made with a variety, so in the end, the surgery probably got rid of it. The seed was wrong. The soil was wrong. Soil is important for seeds, if you don't have the right soil with food and warmth and water, they won't grow. If you grow it too wet, they'll rot. If it's too dry, 
they'll die and won't start. If it's too dark, they won't come up. Though some like the dark, if it's too light, some won't come up. You need to know. When I was about six, living in Foundry Road, my dad was instructed by my mother to make a lawn. Lawn was a bit posh, really, a bit of grass. But I remember it was the first time I'd ever seen the dry seed go in the ground and gradually these green things came up. And I can see that in my mind now because it was so made such an impression on me that out of these little dusty dry seeds comes this life. And that is what, of course, all seeds have in them. This is a, a fruit potato. But if you want to plant potatoes, you need potatoes of about half this size. And you plant them, put them deep, and you leave them for three months. And after three months, you get them up with a spade, or if you've got them in a pot like me, you dip them out. And wonderfully, you see, while you've done nothing about it, they're made about another eight, ten potatoes. And you can't see them until you get them up. And there they are. You can't see what's growing until you actually look at the right time. Even better is to eat them. Jesus taught us that he is the sower and the seed he sows in people's lives is the message of God. This seed, unlike my Lobelia seed, is genuine and proper and will produce a crop if the soil allows it. In this story we read just now, there are three soils which are no good, and there's one which is really good. And this parable, this parable demands that this morning we consider our own decision-making, that is, our hearts and our minds, and see whether we will receive the message of the kingdom of God. This parable is about the seed, which is perfect, and us, the soil, hmm, not always. So first of all, the parable, verses 1 to 9. You can follow it in the Bible if you wish. In this verses here, Jesus gives us this famous parable. Some of you may have known it and heard it many times. To some of us, it will not be well known. And we're going to look at it together now. First, we see that just before this, Jesus has had all sorts of opposition. And many people will still follow in Jesus, though, wanting to know more. So they crowded down by the sea, and in order to speak with them, Jesus got into a boat and spoke to them from the sea to teach them. And he began to teach them. And it says he used parables. Jesus spoke in parables, which are stories with a meaning to get the interest of his hearers. After all, they know about sowing seed. Many of them did it for a living. And Jesus wanted them to, wanted to plug into their lives to make them think. So as they enjoyed the story and said, hmm, yes, that's what happens, I know, it happened in my, my fields. Then they would think, but what is he saying to me? And Jesus is saying the same to us today. You must decide whether you'll receive this seed or not and how you will treat it if it lands. So this parable is the parable of the sower, or of the seed, or of the soils. All things, I think. The thinker today, particularly of the seed and the soils. In this parable, Jesus talked about four places where the seed falls. It falls on a path, hard, worn down, trodden, and eaten then by birds. It fell on se seeds, fell on rocky soil, not much depth. Here 
hear what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. Don't just enjoy the story. Don't just say, oh, I've known that for 30 years. Listen and respond. That's the point of it. He wants us to pay attention to what he's saying. He wants us to really <coughs> want to listen to him. Jesus had been talking with Pharisees, and he told them their hearts, their desires, their mindset were stony. They couldn't receive the seed. Jesus wants us to have ears and hearts that are keen to hear from him. We must listen to what he's saying. Do you really want to hear from Jesus about your life, about him, about what you must and do and shouldn't do and will do, ought to do? He's teaching us through this parable. But why parables? Jesus tells us in verses 10 to 17 the reason. Jesus' disciples wanted to know, Master, why are you teaching the people in parables? Why don't you just come out and straight with it? Why didn't you say things directly? And Jesus replies and tells them in his verses 10 to 17. Jesus says this. You disciples understand what I have told you and you understand because you want to understand. So God has given you the power to understand. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. They have been given understanding by God because they're with him and they want to know and they listen to him. But on the other hand, there are those who did not understand because they don't want to. So God does not give them the power to understand it. Here again is the point to be made. Do you really want to hear from God? Do you really want to go his way? Do you really want his message to go deep into your life? Today, some people don't understand simply because they don't want to. <coughs> I remember reading about one significant atheist in our country, and it was absolutely clear from what he said that he was not open to understanding about the being of God. He really didn't want there to be a God. And that's what made him to come to his conclusion. His ideas are very challengeable. But he wouldn't listen. Jesus says, whoever has, more will be given. If you open your heart a bit, God will teach you and you want more. God will teach you more and more and more. Today, do you want this? Jesus even says that Isaiah the prophet prophesied about this very situation. At first it seems that people are looking and trying to understand, but as we go into that quotation from Isaiah, we see the people's hearts were hard and calloused. Their ears were boomed so they couldn't hear. Their eyes were shut so they couldn't see. You see, this is, this is, this is deliberate chosen, not listening, not looking. And there are those like that who will not listen. People like that have spiritual ears, but they don't listen. They're deaf. People like that have spiritual eyes, but they're shut. They don't learn God's ways because they do not want to. They're looking and listening, many of them, for something but it's not the truth of God. Brothers and sisters, you and I must have soft and open spiritual hearts. Hearing spiritual ears. Eyes that are open. Are you and I open to being taught by God? Are you open to the words of Jesus in your life? Or do you close the door and say, no, I've heard enough. I believe a bit. I don't want to follow what you're telling me. If we really want to hear from God, we can ask him to teach us, and he will. 
Jesus wants us all to know more and more about him and his teachings and his person and his life in us. And thankfully, with this parable, we have the meaning from Jesus. And that is the third point, the explanation. Verses 18 to 23. As you read the Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, particularly Matthew, Mark and Luke, you will find Jesus tells many, many stories. And usually, he doesn't explain them. He leaves them hanging. So people think, hmm, what's that mean? What does it mean for me? Or they say, I don't want to hear. But in this parable, Jesus gives us a complete understanding of what it means. Soil one. The seeds that fell on the path were eaten by birds. Jesus says, these are the people who don't understand the word of God because they don't want to, and the devil confuses them or convinces them that what they've heard about God isn't true. You may know people like that. There is plenty of deception happening right now when it comes to what the Bible teaches, the gospel of God. Some of this deception is because people are in places where they teach false things. They preach them in churches and on media. You can read all sorts of extraordinarily rubbish on the media. There are those who say, if you're a scientist, you can't believe what the Bible says. This is an immense lie. Uh, we have in our church a doctor of physics, Jenny. Uh, one of my sons is a medical scientist who's going to lecture on these things in Bradford University. They believe what God has said. There's no contradiction. Because science can only investigate what God has made. And it can't answer the big questions of life, where's God with us? The two are complementary. And where they seem to be a difference, examinations need to be made. Often the science changes its mind over periods of time. So to say you can't believe God and be a scientist is an enormous lie. Many great scientists have done. David Smith is a... How did you get a master's degree, David? Yeah. Master's degree in astrophysics. Come on. He's brainier than two of me. There are many, many other lies put out. In our schools and for, on, on our, on for our children... That God has made 72 different genders. Say no more. These consummate and enormous lies destroy people. It is the work of Satan to confuse people. He works through this confusion, this disturbance, try, trying to present, prevent the seed of the true gospel from taking root. Do you know whether that's disturbed you or not? If you're unsure, and confused, get the word of Jesus in you deeply. Soil two. Here the seed falls on rocky places. And Jesus says, these people, he compares to this rocky place, are those who believe the message and may get really excited, but fall away. Because when times get tough, they can't cope with it. Some of these people need our sympathy. And I've known quite a few over the years. We had quite a number like that in Beacon House, the home for ex-offenders, just up the road here, who set off with a burst. But when it got out to real life, it was very tough. Some fell away, some bounced back. The temptation is to set off with a burst and then life gets tough and say, oh, well, no, I give up. It's only on the surface. It's very easy then to turn your back on the teaching of God when things get tough in your life. Oh, why is this happening to me? God, I don't want to know about you anymore. That's really silly. 
And there's some people who give up when they face persecution. I have sympathy for that. In the early church, when enormous persecution of the Roman Empire came on to Christians and all the disciples were killed off, except for John, and many other great leaders were killed off, and the older people were killed off, many others turned away and said, well, this is too much. And I think you can understand that. And when the persecution ended, many of these people who turned back wanted to become in the church again. And the church had a problem. Do we believe them? I suppose they sorted it in different places, in different ways. But it's tough and hard when the opposition to persecution comes, when they laugh at you at school, when you go to college and you have to stand out, where you go to work and they have to let it be known that you belong to Jesus. It is sometimes very tough. I remember working on those big flats, St. James Flats in town, when I was 16 to earn a bit of cash as we hadn't got any. And I worked in the stores. Fortunately, I wasn't carrying heavy stuff. I'd have fallen over. And there was this lad from Hyde Park, big beefy sort of lad, much bigger than me. And every day, he said to me, hit me. I knew what would happen if I hit him. I'd soon be on the floor. So I refused to do that, saying I was a Christian person. Whew, I did sweat. Sometimes tough. Some people give in to the opposition and persecution at home and school and college and work, hide away what little faith they have and it dies off because God's word isn't let in deeply. If you've done that, ask for forgiveness and start again because you're still here. But it is essential to make a firm and clear stand when you go to a new place. Quietly, but firm. And note also that though some people fall away when they go to college and university, many others are converted in those situations. Many, many. Thousands every year. So these people are people who profess to belong to Jesus, but they don't really want the commitment it takes. Sympathy for everybody with an addiction problem who becomes a Christian. It's tough. But these things can be beaten, even if slowly, with ups and downs, if that's wanted. Some people in this category may just, belong, just want to belong to a nice, warm, welcoming church, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course. To meet good people. Or maybe they were just brought up as Christians in a Christian home, but have never had to say for themselves, yes, I stand here, I believe this. So when they realise things aren't easy, they can give up. Let me tell you something. Studies have found out that 52% of the people in this country believe Jesus rose from the dead. Over and over again, the studies show that. So you think to yourself, So when people are presented with the good news of Jesus, many people will believe that he died. And he died for their sins. I had to go to school to tell them that in year four, not long ago. And he rose from the dead. Many people will say, yes, yes, yes. But what prevents people from becoming disciples of Jesus is they don't want the commitment of changing their lives. The cost. This is what this is about. Will you pay the cost? Becoming a Christian is free, but it's costly, isn't it? And by goodness, it was costly for Jesus. Think about that. Think about that. I remember a young married man who came here. He'd been here as a youth. Came with his wife and family. And when challenged about where he stood, he said this. I am not ready for the commitment. They left and never came again. I just thought that was deeply tragic. 
for us and for him. And I can understand people fearing the cost of following Jesus. But let me say to anybody who may be thinking that today, the cost of following Jesus is there, but the joy beats it ten times. Such people are shallow soil people, without determination or commitment, no deep root in their walk with God. Could that be you? Ever changing and wobbly? Remember, of course, that when we fail, if we repent, God will bring us back up again. If we want it. Soil three. This is seed, the seed of God, his message, his word, that falls amongst thorny areas. Nettles, and thistles, bushes, prickly bushes. These are people who don't accept the word of God because they're too distracted with other things. Things they can see and feel and imagine. Too busy with their media and their phones, too busy with their enjoyments, their immediate satisfactions, not looking beyond the end of their noses, <coughs> occupied with the cheap, shiny things <coughs> offered by the world which do not satisfy more than a short time. Focused on looking at what is under their noses for immediate pleasures, and don't see the kingdom of God for what it is. So its message is choked out by worries of life and by chasing after wealth. I had a friend at college, not a particular friend, but I knew her, called Patricia. She seemed to be a very good Christian. And uh, I think she was. But it got to her third year, and she, still had no boyfriend, still was single. So she latched on to a lad, I'll say if it was from the rugby playing group, plenty of beer and whatever's most unsuitable, and Christian friends, Christian leaders talked with her, but she wouldn't let go. I think she was worried about being single and chased after the satisfaction of being married. Easy to go after those things. God has a best plan for us, not what we see. Four, the soil of good soil, the seed that fell on good soil. These are people who hear the word of God, receive it, and produce good food, fruit. These are blessed by God because they hear, they understand, and do what God tells them to do. These people have open eyes, hearing ears, soft hearts to hear what God is saying. God has spoken to them, he's worked in them, the word has gone down deeply, he's given them their spirit, his spirit, so they can understand and receive the message and move forward, perhaps gradually, well, often gradually, Sometimes up and down, we all are that. But the word of God has taken root <clears throat> and produces the fruit. Here the harvest comes, and only here. And the amazing fruit is they produce 160, 30 times what was sown. They're bearers of great harvest. Do you want to be that? Make your soil right. Here's the question. What soil are you today? It is the condition of the soil that matters. It is the condition of our hearts and minds that matter. Our hearts must not be hardened against things of God. We must be hungry and humble to receive the word of God. This is the bottom line today. We are blessed when we hear, understand and obey the word of God. Ask the Holy Spirit to teach you more and more what you want and need to hear. So before you listen to the preaching, before you read the Bible at home and with others, pray that God will speak and you will hear. That the message of the kingdom of heaven will deeply penetrate your heart and mind and will and life. 
But there is one more thing to say <coughs> about this parable. It has a point to make about making Jesus known, about the church evangelising. It tells us that as we share the gospel, we must remember that there will be different responses. Some will not hear and will oppose. And we go out in the open air, as we have done and shall be doing again, an egg may come through. We had that once, I think. Some people will respond, but without a lasting decision to follow Jesus. Many will respond positively. I had an extraordinary week today, uh, this week, <laughs> with some people I used to teach. Earlier in the week, I got a Facebook message saying that the, it was the birthday of a, a lad I used to teach called Christopher Kelsey. Uh, very nice lad, very lovely lad, polite and pleasant and hardworking. I knew his mother, spoke with her, I knew his father, he was a head teacher at Eddington, <coughs> one of the Eddington primary schools. So I sent him a message wishing him a happy birthday. I happily remember this lad. And this is what came back. <laughs> sir, oh, I wish he hadn't said that. But anyway, <laughs> sir, I remember those happy times when we were in the Christian fellowship in your office at lunchtime. He could have said, I enjoyed playing football. He might have said, that's what I bought. He taught me maths, I loved it. Why did he say, I like the Christian fellowship in your office? There were only about six or eight of us. Now, I don't know I was brilliant at it. But this man, now 50, his first thought was to say thank you for, God, for that. And I wondered if God was saying to me, you've planted a seed. <laughs> Again this week, I met a young, well not young now, a lady called Rachel Wallace, whose family lives and work Cairo. Rachel is now working in Madagascar as in mission work, particularly with children and young people and their families, many of them in serious need. Many, many, many are coming to faith in Jesus. Their very missionary outreach, the children, young people and their families take Bibles everywhere. I think she must be 50-something. But I met her because Stephen Clark knew her when he was at that church. They kept contact, and I get prayer stuff from Rachel. We met her in the tea room in a cafe in a pretty coffee place, I think. It's probably not a very nice name for a coffee place. <laughs> anyway, we met there. It's lovely to see Rachel again, because when I last saw her, she was this size, very skinny, very skinny. I wouldn't say she was skinny either, but she was that tall. She nearly crushed me with a hug. But interestingly, she said, suddenly said this, this is I bought, and I said, call me Richard. She said, I remember once in class at Partridge Primary School, you said this, God is everlasting. She said, I thought about that. And I've often thought about that. And of course, I have no idea that that little seed was planted. She said, that's spoken to me many times. So, so I said to you, be aware. Oh, God will use what you don't know you're saying. Very often. Our job is not to bring the results, but to sow the seed. The results of the planting of the seed is God's business. Our business is to share the message, to sow the seed, and God will handle the rest. So that is it in terms of reaching out with the seed and what the response will be. But the key question this morning is, where are you when it comes to God in your heart? What sort of soil are you today? Let us pray. Our Father God, we thank you for this parable of Jesus, which asks these powerful questions very clearly explained and we pray that you will help us to be soil that takes the message in deeply and when we mess up which we will when we let you down which we do strengthen us again that your word will dwell in our hearts and be fruitful 
for Jesus' sake. Amen. I searched high and low, and I finally found, found some words of a hymn that I wanted to finish with, and it is all about this uh, parable. A farmer sowed his precious seed. You won't know the words, but you will know the tune. Farmer sowed his precious seed upon the path one day, and when the birds came down for food, he snatched it all away. Oh, Father, may your word be sown deep down within my heart. So when the devil comes to tempt, it never shall depart. And some he scattered came to rest on rocky stony ground. But when the sunshine caught the blocks, not one green shoot was found. Oh, Father, bring your word of life, take root within my heart. So when perplexing trials come, it never shall depart. And other seedlings landed where thick brambles sharp were thorn. Sprang up, extending far and wide, and choked the tender corn. Oh, Father, may your word of power go strong within my heart. So when the world's distractions come, it never shall depart. But all the farmer, farmer's toil, a crop was brought to birth. As healthy blasts grew up from seed that fell on the tide Oh, Father, Lord of harvest, God, your Spirit's grace imparts. which I'd like us to say together as we bless one another. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May God bless us still, so that 